All right, let's dive into diffusion then. And we'll start by talking about how it works from an atomistic perspective. I like this image. Here you see these white atoms. They start to diffuse through the material. They're basically vibrating, hopping, and every once in a while, they hop from one side to the other, if that spot is empty. Because of this, there's this net diffusion from a concentrated region where they started out, and then they're going to spread out through the material. So here it's starting over again. It starts out concentrated, and it will slowly move down the composition gradient. In a nutshell, that's what's happening. Now we've got some math that explains this a little bit. Uh, let's first think of jumping from one side to the other as hopping with an activation energy. So we're going to draw this potential energy landscape, right? So we're, we're plotting energy on this axis, right? And then we're showing different positions on the x-axis, going from position number one, going from position one to position two. So what's going to happen here? What's going to happen is that as an atom hops from position one to position two, it has to overcome an activation energy, right? So it might look something like this. Okay. Now, why is there an activation energy? Well, think about it. As you saw in this picture, these atoms might have to push the blue atoms a little bit out of the way or get uncomfortably close to them, right? And that's going to cost a little bit of energy until it gets to the other spot, and then it's just like it was before. Now, because of this, we can actually calculate the flux of atoms moving from position one or moving from position two, right? So moving from position one to two, that would be dn1, Right, the change in the concentration of atoms at position 1 with time, dt. And going the other way would be dn2 dt. So the change in the concentration of atoms at position 2 with respect to time. Right, And then, again, the activation energy, delta gm, would be right there. Delta g um, that would be our activation energy, right? Now we could actually write out mathematically what these two fluxes are equal to, right? These two changes in concentration. Um, dn1 dt is equal to dn2 tt if this is a flat line between them. And that's going to be equal to v times f times the exponential of our negative activation energy over thermal energy. v is going to be the attempt frequency. So if these atoms are vibrating, then it's that vibrational frequency, right? That's going to be our attempt frequency. F is going to be the fraction of atoms in the correct configuration. What do we mean by that? Well, if these are your um, hosts, right? And let's say it's hopping through the interstitials, right? So this atom is, it wants to hop, but if this already has an atom there, then it can't go there, right? That's forbidden because that spot's taken. So F is the fraction of atoms in the correct configuration for the direction that you're considering, right? And then lambda is going to be your jump frequency per atom, right? So that, that's something you could actually calculate if you knew the vibrational frequency in these different configurations, as well as the activation energy, right? Now, how does this all get changed if you have a composition gradient in your material? If you've got a composition gradient in your material, that introduces a chemical potential gradient, right? So it would look like this. We still have our energy. We've still got position one, and we've got position two. But this time, there's a difference in composition moving from position one towards position two. Therefore, your plot would look like this, right? Going from position one to position two, what do you have? You have the same activation energy that you had before. You still have delta gm, right? So your flux from one to two is the same as it was before. You still have dn1 dt. But going backwards, dn2 t dt is different because it has a large larger activation energy because it also has this change in the chemical potential to account for, or the chemical potential gradient, right? And think of that as a composition gradient. When you have a composition gradient, it's going to change it, right? It's going to mean that your flux going from 1 to 2 is much larger than the flux going from 2 to 1. Let's draw this with a smaller arrow, to, arrow to, to denote that, right? Many fewer atoms are able to hop over this larger hill than the ones that are able to hop over this way, right? So mathematically, we could write these two expressions out. Here's dn1 dt. It's just what we showed you before. dn2 dt looks very similar, except it's got this extra term in the exponential, right? It's got the activation energy plus the chemical potential gradient, right? So you could actually figure out the flux, right? What's the net movement of atoms from 1 to 2, right? If you've got more moving from 1 to 2, but you've got some moving back from 2 to 1, what's your net movement, right? What would be 
your total amount that's moving? Well, we could do that. You just subtract one from the other. dn1 dt minus dn2 dt would be this expression here. And if the chemical potential gradient is small, then this could be approximated by that term right there. And again, if you were to then to start plugging things in, right, based off of V and F, we could say, well, if it's a cubic arrangement, right, where it can hop six different directions, but only one of them is the one that we're interested in here, going from position one to position two, then it would be one-sixth, assuming that it vibrates an, uh, in an isotropic manner in all different directions, right? Uh, so you could get mathematical about this and actually calculate the flux. J is now our flux, right? Um, a flux is the number of atoms per area per time that's going to be moving, right? So for some unit area, if you imagine like a, a net that these things are passing through, the area of this net, right, you're looking at the number of atoms per area per time. That would be equal to our flux. So we're going to see a lot of that this chapter um, and next when we talk about flux of heat or flux of uh, atoms. That's, that's what we're talking about. It's the number of those um, that's moving per area per time. Okay. So this would be the atomistic derivation of some of these diffusion equations. You will see a lot more of this when you take kinetics and thermo, um, but this is a primer to think about how atoms move through material. And again, I think the way to think of it is with activation energies. And if you have a chemical potential, it basically stacks this activation as being larger. And so that's why you don't see a net movement in that direction. So from an atomic perspective, it's all about atoms moving from a filled spot to an empty spot. Well, this can be different things. It could be an actual lattice position where a vacancy is present or it could be an empty interstitial site, right? So in either case, diffusion mechanisms relies on two key things happening. First off, you must be adjacent to an empty site, whether that's a lattice site or an interstitial, it has to be empty. And the other thing is you have to have sufficient energy to either, to both break your bonds and to distort the lattice slightly during the, diff, the diffusion process, right? And the fact is that only some fraction of your total is going to have enough vibrational energy to do this, but this fraction increases with temperature. So as you heat the sample up, um, more and more of your atoms are going to be uh, qualified to, more and more of your atoms are going to be eligible to be involved in the diffusion process because they have enough energy to overcome these things. So vacancy diffusion. Um, this is going to be the exchange of a site with a vacancy on the adjacent site. So imagine that you've got a lattice like this, right, with a vacancy here. It's possible for your atom to jump here and fill that vacant site, and in doing so, it creates a vacancy on the site where it used to be. So it's an exchange of this atom and the vacancy, right? Um, obviously, this one, its diffusion rate will be dependent on how many of these vacancies there are, which in itself is a function of the vacancy activation energy, QV, right, which we already learned about. Okay, something to note here is that your vacancy travels this way, right? Your vacancy traveled to the left, but your atom traveled to the right, so they're going to be traveling in opposite directions, okay? Now, it's also possible to move via interstitial diff uh, diffusion. So this is going to be migration from one interstitial site to another. So you might have an interstitial here, and it's able to hop there, right? Now, yeah, this was a vacancy before, and so you could say that the vacancy traveled and moved here. But since these are interstitial sites, those are by definition already vacant. So we don't typically call them vacancies. They're understood to be vacant because they're interstitial sites, okay? Now, because interstitial sites are typically pretty small, then the only real atoms that are going to be eligible to be involved in interstitial diffusion are going to be small atoms. Carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. By the time you get to larger things like oxygen, it's less and less likely that that's to be the mode by which they travel, right? Um, and it's very uncommon for host or substitu substitutional atoms to diffuse this way because they're too large. So the question is, which mechanism will be faster right, for diffusion? Will it be vacancy or interstitial, and why? Well, it's going to be interstitial for sure. I mean, we'll get to some numbers in a minute, but it's way faster. Why is that? Well, think about it. For one thing, it's basically pure vacancies. All these interstitials, we've already said that they're all vacant. So it's not like you're waiting for a vacancy to come by. Likely, it's already vacant. So that's going to be one reason why it's higher, right? You're not relying on some low number of vacancy concentrations. But the other reason is that these are small atoms. So for them to squish through here and go to that next thought, they're not really pushing on these atoms very much. 
they're much smaller, and so there's less distortion. So both of those reasons combined makes interstitial diffusion far faster than vacancy diffusion.